Okay, let's move on to part B. A statistician was comparing the performance of fourth grade boys and girls on an agility test. The test asked them to jump from side to side across a set of parallel lines, counting the number of lines they clear in 30 seconds. Here are the results. And you can see there's two sets of data, one for boys, one for girls. Um, I'm asked to make a combination histogram and box plot for each gender and sketch the graphs below. Also, I'm told to use this particular window with a minimum x of 10, max x of 30. The x scale is 4. By the way, that value is what determines the width of your bends. And let me spell this because apparently I pronounce this incorrectly. B-I-N, how wide each one is. Um, so let's go ahead and do this. I, the first thing I did is I already did enter the data. I didn't want you to sit here and suffer through that. So when I turn on the calculator, um, you can see I've got list one and list two both entered. Uh, notice that one thing that's different is because this is a, it's a, not a, I'm not doing bivariate data here. I have two different lists of data. The X and Y values don't have to line up. I can have more X's than, uh, than Y's. So let's go ahead and set up to create a scatter plot and a um, box plot combination. I'm sorry, combination histogram and box plot for each gender. So I'm going to do this first of all for the boys. So to set up a statistics plot, right, we, we're going to hit second and then go to stat plot. Here we are. And because I want to do two things, I want to see both the the histogram and the box plot simultaneously. I'm going to turn on two different plots. So let's turn on the first one. So I'm just going to tap on, and then I'm going to go down, and I'm going to go over to the uh, box plot, and I'm going to pick the first one where I attempt to look at uh, outliers. Notice as soon as I press enter, what happened, right? It went away, and the only thing I had was list number one, right? So I don't need bivariate data if I'm just doing a, a box plot. I just need the one set of numbers. Um, now that that one's set up, let's go up and I'm going to go modify my second plot, this plot number two. For this one, of course, I need to turn it on as well. And then I'm going to go down and turn it into a histogram. And again, data went away there. So <clears throat> normally at this point, I would hit zoom and then nine for zoom the data. But I want to use this particular window that I've been assigned. So I'm going to go ahead and um, I can go ahead and quit my my uh, stat plot setup. And I'm just going to go ahead and go to window. And you can see I want a minimum x value of 10. It's set at negative 10. I'm going to make it just positive 10. I want a maximum x value of 30. There we go. The scale is going to be 4. And then my y, my minimum y will be negative. I'm not quite sure why this is necessary. I'll do uh, uh, negative 3.5. And my y max will be 10. And then finally, my last value there is the x scale. Those are both going to be left at 1. OK, so I've got this window set up. So as soon as I hit graph, I should see both. And there they are. There's the combination box plot up on top and the histogram down below. Uh, one of the things that's very nice about this view is that I, if I press the trace button, right, trace is right here. When I press that, I can toggle between different things. So right now, I'm up on the the box plot, and you can see the cursors uh, flashing right there. If I hit the down arrow, it switches it to the histogram. So now I'm looking at my, my histogram. So I can toggle between the two different views. The other thing I can do is as I move along, you can see each of the... Uh, the bends where they're starting and up to their up to value. So for example, this first bend, which has zero values in it, begins at the number 10 and it goes up to 14, but does not include 14, right? This is the max value for this particular bend is less than 14. If you get a 14, that's the start of the next one over. So you can see this one runs from 14 up to, but not including the 18. And there's two values uh, over again. This one is from 18 to 22. Uh, and it contains two values. This one's from 22 to 26. It contains six values. So what's nice about this view is it allows me to make a very compelling and believable sketch that would probably be difficult otherwise. So let's go ahead and cre create a sketch um, for this. Uh, to do this, uh, I highly recommend using a ruler of some type. And I'm on a, a screen right here, so I'm going to use this the electronic ruler. Uh, and I guess I'll go ahead and mark off my... Um, 
my boundaries first of all. So this first one starts at the number 26. So you can see, I'll pull this over here. It begins at, oh no, that's the last one. Let's go back over here. The first one begins at 10. So I'm going to start here at 10. And it goes from 10 to 14, but it, there's nothing in that particular one. So the next one starts at 14. And it goes all the way until, uh, I'm sorry, it starts at uh, starts at 14 and goes to 18 and there are two values in this so what i'm going to do is just use my straight edge here well i guess i'll use this red pen excuse me and just draw this this one line so that's too high i can come over here it goes all the way to 18 and i'll just finish that oh that's too high but the next one's too high also so i'll just make this too high and then i'll just go over here the next one goes to the number 22 and i'm just counting by four because that was the the X scale. Now this next line actually is going to go all the way up to a value of six for the next one over. So I'm going to go ahead and draw this all the way up to the number six. You can't quite see that on your screen, but this is roughly where six is. If I move this over, you can see here's the number six. So this is six tall. And then the last one I've got is just one unit tall. And that runs from uh, 20. Oh, I've gotten off somehow here. Let's see, this was ends at, uh, oh, yeah, that's the start of this one. It, it, I got to make this one, I got a height of nothing, there we go, ends at 26. And then the last one starts at 26, and it goes four more to that to 30. So I'm just going to draw my last little line here, and this last one just has one unit in it, so I'll just draw the one there. Uh, now I'll just go ahead and rotate my ruler here, and I'll just finish off these parts. So this uh, this is a very nice little top for this one. Just draw that line. And then I got the top here. I'll draw this little line. Well, probably it's a little short there. And then the last one here is just going to be one unit tall. So there's my histogram. And I want you to really see how I'm reading these values from the calculator, right? The fact that I press trace and I can use it to just read these values very precisely uh, makes it a very compelling box plot. Last thing, I'm sorry, histogram. The last thing I do want to do is go up here and, and grab these values for my um the box plot and you can see the minimum value here is the number 17 so i'm just going to put a couple dots here this is going to start at 17 and this doesn't really matter where i place this but i'm going to just put a, a dot here actually i'll just i'll just sketch this one so that's 17 and then i the first quartile q1 is at 18 so that's just going to be this line here and then i go to the number um what is it 22 is the median I'm just draw my median right here, and then I go to the next one. Uh, Q3 is at the number 23. Oh, it's just clearly one over. And then my last value from my five number summary is 29. So I'm just going to draw this line uh, right at the 29. And then I can connect up these. This is the 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 two middle quartiles there. And then I'll just draw this and this. So now I've got a very nice an accurate looking uh, box plot. So let me go ahead and um, do the girls one real quick and then we'll discuss the two of them together. I'm actually gonna draw it while you're not watching but I was thinking it would be, it's kinda good to see how you could switch the data to get the other one. So if I wanna switch this to the girls data, <clears throat> what I need to do is just press second, go into my stats plot. The only change I need to make is just tell it where this data is coming from. So the boy data was stored in uh, list one, so now I'm just going to pull up. Um, it's just second L2, pull up list two, and I need to do that for the for the box plot, or yeah, that's the box plot, and also for the histogram. So I'm just going to come in here and change this to second um, list two, so I can see both of those. Uh, my window is going to stay exactly the same. And here's this uh, graph. Now again, I'm going to hit trace, and I'm going to go ahead and draw this over here. Um, off the video. Okay, so when I put that together, the the girl box plot, the girl's box plot, and and histogram is now shown. So as I look at this, it appears. In fact, it kind of helps if I'm looking at a nice vertical line to compare these two. Uh, if I if I pull this over here, this is this is the Q3 for the boys. If you look at that line, and if you look at it, it's kind of an interesting point. In fact, let me highlight this in blue. With this pen if you if you look at this what's happening here is that 
the top 25% of the boys, or let's let's say this another way, 75% of the boys scored lower than than half of the girls, right? The the boys top quartile, um, the top 25%, um, the, that's kind of where the girls are. The girls they're 50%. So the Q3 for the boys was um, the girls median or yeah the median for the girls so it appears that the you know the bulk of the girl distribution 50 percent of them are above that number what is it 20 23 and only a quarter of the boys are above that number so uh, there was one point that the calculator kind of identified as a potential outlier it happened there when uh the one that had a score of 12 so i represented that as a box uh this single box right here but everything else I'm pretty much just copying from the uh, the graph. And I did write this uh, slight description down here at the bottom. I said, this group of girls are more agile. They have a higher mean and median. Half of the girls scored 23 or higher. And, uh, and I think three quarters of the boys were below that value. All right, let's move on to the back side of, of part B. A couple expressions here that we're asked to simplify. It says your answer should contain only positive exponents, and also we don't like any common factors laying around. So let's go ahead and look at the first one here. First thing that catches my eye is I do have um, a factor of 2 and a factor of 4 that aren't being raised to powers at all. So one of the things I'll probably do is just bring this factor of 2 and this factor of 4, place them together and say, well, that, that's just the number 8. Uh, the other thing that I can see here is that there's just the cluster of three factors of u, right? It's u to the third power. Nowhere else in this expression do I see any values of u. So I can safely write there's u to the third power. So I've got 8u to the third. The final thing that I need to consider is this portion, right? I've got v to the negative second being multiplied by uh, whoops, I already took care of the 4, be multiplied by this one factor of v. So if I combine that, I, I think I think we're pretty clear on the fact that if I have, for example, x to the second power times x to the third power, right, this is equivalent to five factors of x. It's xx times xxx, so there's five factors of xx to the fifth power. And the shortcut there is I can just simply add this 2, right, and add with the 3, and I get the factor of 5. Well, I could do something similar here, right? You can see that there is this factor of it's to the negative second power. But then it's like v to the, wait a minute, what power is that, right? Well, there's just a single factor of v. That's an implicit v to the first power. And if I combine those, that gives me v to the negative first power. And of course, that's not how I'm going to write that answer. I mean, I'm not going to have it times v to the negative first. That factor of v is going to be relocated to the denominator, right? So this is over v to the positive first power that that exponent's optional so i could just over v so this is the answer to number three um if you're interested in more about how you deal with negative exponents well let's look at question four because it's going to give us an opportunity to do that um i'll, I'll do i'll do my uh first thing we talked about this year one way that we can deal with negative exponents is multiplying by the number one and in this case the number one i might multiply would be uh, m to the fourth power times n to the negative second times uh, raised to the fourth power. And I'm going to do that on both the numerator and the denominator. So m to the fourth power times n to the negative second time, uh, raised to the fourth power. So this thing that I'm looking at that I've written down here is just nothing but the number one. You can see I've got exactly the same factors over the exact same factors. What's convenient about this number one is because I'm raising this to the positive fourth power, and I'm going to multiply that by the exact same thing to the negative fourth power, that's going to make this just raised to the zero power. This is going to be the whatever, you know, it's going to be this entire expression raised to the zero power. And what's convenient about that is that's just the number one. So all of a sudden you can see I've eliminated the negative exponent by multiplying by the number one. And it did this trick of introducing just the number one in the numerator. In my denominator, I have this thing raised to the fourth power. Now, I am going to go ahead and raise each one of these to the fourth. I, I can do it two ways. I can write out 
four identical copies of this, or I could just use these laws of exponents, and I know that my m is being raised to the 16th power, and I know that n is being raised to the, and I don't like how that 16 doesn't look like here, to the 16th power, and I've got n being raised to the negative 8th power. Well, there I am with another negative exponent. I thought I got rid of them when I dealt with the 4, but it's still here. It's not difficult to deal with, right? All I'm going to do is those eight factors of n, I'm going to relocate into the numerator. And the, the logic exa is exactly what I just did here. But I do this so much at this time point, I'm just like, you know what? Do I have to keep writing this? n to the eighth, n to the eighth, I multiplied by the number 1. What's in the numerator now? Oh, it's an n. I'll, I'll write this in red because it's going to be my answer. I've got n to the 8th. And what's in the denominator? That's just 16. Oh, no, it's not. It's m to the 16th power, right? And I have times the number 1 because this, this n to the negative 8th times n to the positive 8 is n to the 0, which is 1. So my final answer then is just n to the 8th over 16 or m to the 16th power, rather. Let's go look at number 6. Okay, so I'm going to take a different tact here. I can see that this is there's no binomials here. This is just a, a monomial, and I'm raising it to the third power. So the laws of exponents, I can raise the numerator to the third power and the denominator to the third power. And then another law of exponent I can use is I can, within that numerator, I can raise each of the clusters of factors to the third power as well. So this is what it looks like in kind of the abbreviated shortcut version. This is x to the negative sixth power times y to the ninth power divided by, let's see, 2 to the third power is 2 times 2 times 2, which is 8. I've got 8 in the denominator, and then I've got a y to the sixth power. So two problems, right? I've got this x to the negative sixth, which can't be left that way. So I'm going to go ahead and just move those factors into my denominator by making them a positive exponent. So I end up with 8 times x to the positive 6 over y, and then the, don't forget the y to the 6. And then one final thing here, you can see I've got 9 factors of y in the numerator. I've got 6 factors of y in the denominator. So when I combine those 6, six of the factors of y in the denominator with 6 of the factors of y in the numerator, right, it cancels. And I'm left with just 8x to the 6th power. And that is going to be multiplied by just 3 factors of uh I'm sorry. Yeah. No. I, no. I've got the three factors of y in the numerator. Now that I've done that, I'm totally humiliated here. Let me this over this, right? So that's y to the ninth over y to the sixth, right? If I want to be real precise, I can rewrite this as y to the sixth times y to the third. Nothing wrong with that over y to the 6. So you can see this is the number 1. And I'm left with three factors of y in the numerator. There they are. So this is my final answer. It's y cubed over 8x to the 6. I missed question 5. It's back over here. Let's get to that. Um, OK, a couple things. I'm just going to migrate some of these factors. There are this, uh, I've got this a to the negative third in the denominator. And I've got b to the negative fourth up in the numerator. So I'm going to use that multiplying trick, kind of collapse those steps down and just write this as this is going to be a to the sixth power. And actually using my laws of exponents, 3 minus negative 3 is 6. And then also I can write negative 4 minus 2 is negative 6. So I could write that for the b. Look at this. I've got b to the negative fourth over b squared, which is b to the negative 4 minus 2, which is b to the negative 6, which I can't leave like that. So I write it as 1 over b to the 6. So the important bit there is that I've got six factors of b in the denominator. But I can see that, right? These, fa the, the, these factors of b, b to the negative 4, just becomes six factors of b down in the, or four factors of b in the denominator. All right, and then final thing, I've, I think I missed one element here. Yeah, I've, I've missed this number 3. So my final answer there is a to the 6 over 3b to the 6. Okay, we've got a couple um, inequalities that we're asked to graph its solution, and it says show your work. So let's start with this first one. Uh, this is not bad. I'm just going to take this inequality. I'm going to subtract 6 
from each side. If I do that, I get that r is greater than 22 minus 6, I believe is the number 16. So r is greater than 16. Now, two things. This is an open boundary, right? And the points that satisfy my inequality, the original one, are to the right of that. And I can ch ch check any of those values, and it works. They work. Also, I know that if I check my favorite number, which is 0, which is way over here somewhere, right? If I plug that in, 0 is not greater than 22. So it's 16, but not including 16. It's everything strictly greater than 16. Uh, on this next one, um, again, I point this out because we're likely to, to make this error. If I consider just the numbers, um, <clears throat> for example, 5, is less than the number 10. If I multiply both sides by the number negative 2, right, this would give me negative 10, and on the other side I'd have negative 20. But the important thing to notice is that the larger one now is the negative 10. So when I multiply or divide both sides of an inequality by a negative value, I must remember to flip the direction of the inequality. And moreover, probably more important than that, is if I just think about finding the boundary location and then testing, it works. So for example, if I have the equation negative 10n equals 20, that would be n is equal to negative 2. So I know this is my boundary location. Right here, and in fact, for this particular problem, the boundary is going to be uh, solid, right? I'll put this solid dot because it's it is right now it's less than or equal to, so I've got a solid boundary there because it's or equal to, and then I could just test above or below this and see. So if I test zero, is zero? Let's see, negative 10 times 10, no, negative 10 times zero. I'm putting in zero for n. Negative 10 times 0 is 0. Is 0 greater than 20? It's like, no, it's not. It's not. So we're going to go this direction on our inequality. So, and again, you can see if I'm not, if I'm kind of careless and I didn't notice to flip the direction, I'd be pointing the wrong way. But if I remember, oh, I'm going to divide both sides by negative 10, I get the negative 2 here and I have to um, uh, flip the direction. So it becomes this, and look what it says. It says, hey, n are those things that are less than or equal to negative 2, which is exactly what our graph is. All right, let's go to number 9. These look awful. I'm going to subtract 9 from both sides, I guess. So I'm going to get 11 minus 9 is 2. So this would become 2 is greater than n over 2. And then I'm going to multiply both sides by 2, so I get 4 is greater than n. But I don't really care about the number 4, so I'm going to rewrite this as n. This says n are the things that are less than 4. So my boundary is at 4. It's an open boundary. And my solution are all those things to the left that are less than 4. Um, and again, a good idea would be to check it. If I put 0 in this, the question is, does it work? Well, is 11 greater than 9? Yeah, if, if this was 0, this would be 9 plus 0, right? 11 is greater than the number 9. So that definitely is the direction that works. And I would venture to say that a point off to the right would fail to work. Last question. Here we go. Uh, I need to clean this up a bit. So I'm going to go ahead and... Uh, distribute the value of 2 outside of this parentheses. I'm going to distribute that across this um, addition problem. Well, it's, it's a, I'm going to distribute the multiplication across the addition. So this is going to become uh, negative x plus 12 plus 2 times 8 is 16x. Uh, I'm going to combine the 16 and negative x. Right, and I'm going to get that 87 is less than 12 plus 15x. Let's take away 12 from both sides. If I take away 12 from both sides, I'm going to get that uh, x is, well, actually 87 plus 12 actually ends up being the number 75. So I'm going to get 75 is less than 15x. And now if I divide by 15, you can see we get that 5 is less than x, but I don't want to know about 5. I want to know about x. Therefore, x must be greater than the number 5. So x is greater than 5. 
my boundary is open my boundary point is open and I'm going to the right I'm going above that so these are all solutions to that inequality right so that's the end of part B